it is not good to become unnecessarily angry. It is the path to hellish life. Now you are going beyond the limit by killing yakshas who are actually not offenders. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. In this verse, the word atirotena means with unnecessary anger. When Dhruva Maharaj went beyond the limits of necessary anger, his grandfather, Swayambhuva Manu, immediately came to protect him from further sinful action. <coughs> from this we can understand that killing is not bad, but when killing <coughs> is done unnecessarily, or when an offenseless person is killed, such killing opens the path to hell. Dhruva Maharaj was saved from such sinful action because he was a great devotee. A Kshatriya is allowed to kill only for maintenance of the law and order of the state. He is not allowed to kill or commit violence without reason. Violence is certainly a path leading to a hellish condition of life, but it is also required for maintenance of the law and order of the state. Here, Lord Manu prohibited Dhruva Maharaj from killing the Yakshas because only one of them was, was punishable for killing his brother, for killing his brother Uttama. Not all of the Yaksha citizens were punishable. We find in modern warfare, however, that attacks are made upon innocent citizens who are without fault. According to the law of Manu, such warfare is a most sinful activity. Furthermore, at the present moment, civilized nations are unnecessarily <coughs> maintaining many slaughterhouses for killing innocent animals. When a nation is attacked by its enemies, the wholesale slaughter of the citizens should be taken as a reaction to their own sinful actions. That is nature's law. Om Ajnana Timirandhasya Jnana Shalakaya Chakshuran Vidanyena Dhasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Namao Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Pasyatya Devsatarine Panchakalpata Lubyascha Nupasindu Yarevacha Patita Nampavane Vyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Atirosena, unnecessarily angry. <laughs> it is a quite difficult thing to discriminate, right? To know what is necessary and what is not necessary. 
So Dhruva Maharaj, being a great devotee and being born in a great family, was very fortunate that he had his illustrious grandfather, Swami Bhuvamanu, there to correct him and to stop him when the anger became excessive. So this is uh, this is the point here that uh, there's a limit to how much you can become angry and how much violence can be used. Sometimes violence is necessary. We were talking yesterday about non-violence, how some people they promote so much non-violent. They simply want to stop all violence and they will go to great extremes to avoid any kind of violence. But here, according to the Bhagavad philosophy, we learn that sometimes violence is necessary. And we can see, for example, in the Manu Samhita, Manu Samhita prescribes that a murderer should be hung. A murderer should get the death penalty. That is proper punishment for someone who is a murderer. Because if he is not properly punished, then he will suffer greatly in the future. Because of his killing. Because kill to kill a person is very sinful. And so the person will certainly suffer. And it's the duty of the state to impose punishment, and the proper punishment for a murderer is capital punishment. In other words, the death penalty is there. Of course, sometimes nowadays, today, they don't like the death penalty, and they avoid it, and they think, oh, we'll just keep him in prison for the rest of his life, you know. But actually, the proper punishment is the death penalty, according to Manu Samhita. That kind of violence is necessary. And sometimes uh, there will be unrest in a state and the government has to take action to bring about law and order. Sometimes things get out of control. People start protesting and they become violent and then the government has to send in a, maybe a police force or a military force in order to stop all the protesting and all the demonstrations and to restore law and order. So that kind of violence is supported. That is proper use of violence. Sometimes the mother will say to the child, <laughs> right, the mother will say, you better behave yourself, otherwise I will have to get violent with you. <laughs> right? Uh, so there is proper use of violence. The question is what is excessive violence and what is proper use of violence. So that is uh, something which one has to be guided by a learned persons. And here you see the Dhruva Maharaj, he was inflicting punishment on all the yakshas. He was punishing all, killing so many yakshas, but only one person was responsible for the death of his brother. So that was certainly excessive. Swayambhu uh, Bhamana says, you, you are killing people who are not offenders. So innocent people are punished. And uh, Prabhupada gives an example how sometimes it happens that during times of war the, the enemy will come and attack and they will bomb the homes of so many people, innocent people, women and children and so on. They can all be injured, they're all affected by the bombing by the uh, actions of the enemy. So these people were 
innocent in some way. They were all innocent people, but they, they get they get somehow uh, punished for something which they're not doing. Just because they live in the country which is the enemy of another country, they're, they're victims of the action of the enemy forces. People, innocent families, their homes can be bombed. So then naturally the people will be very bitter and they will, um, they will feel that it's very unjust and un improper. In the Vedic culture, when there was war, it was fought by the Kshatriyas. There was no question of women and children and so on being involved in the battle. It was for the Kshatriyas to go out and to fight. And the women and the children were at home. And that the, the men would go out and not all men, but only those who were Kshatriyas. But in the modern times, so-called modern times, just like in Prabhupada's time when Prabhupada was in America, there was war between the U.S. and Vietnam. And at that time they were sending, they were doing drafting. All the young men had to join the military and they all had to go to the, get sent to Vietnam and fight in the war in Vietnam. And of course the American people, the young men, they were protesting. They didn't want to do it. They didn't want to go to Vietnam and fight. They, they didn't believe in the war. First of all, the war was actually some political thing that the Americans were fighting, they didn't want Vietnam to become communist. This, there was North Vietnam and South Vietnam. South Vietnam was liberal and North Vietnam was strict communist. And, and uh, America was based in South Vietnam and they were protecting South Vietnam. And so the gate came, became a big war and so many young men and they would be trying to avoid going to the war and they would be hiding in <laughs> all, all the different police forces would be coming, collecting all the young men, round them up and then to the military. And of course the different people would try different things to get out of it, to avoid it. Just like Bari Jan Prabhu, Bari Jan Prabhu was a young man in America at that time, and he was now. <laughs> so immediately he was exempted from going to the Vietnam War. So these kind of things happen, but at the same time, you also get Prabhupada also points out that sometimes. At that time, America was fighting Vietnam, and every day, so many American soldiers were being killed in the Vietnam War. Uh, I went to Vietnam a couple of years ago. Of America, he was killing the cows every day, and his soldiers were going to Vietnam and being killed. It was reaction because every day he was killing so every day his soldiers people who die sometimes Krishna just arranges like that he collects all the people together and he just kills them all they're, they're all killed karma that one war which is taking place and there's always threats of war between different parts of different countries, different places. And these kind of actions, we simply take them for our sense gratification. Just like we're drilling so much petrol. 
now in the U.S. is going on in the world regularly. We depend so much on electricity. And no electricity we are in big difficulty now. So they have to produce electricity by things like atomic reactors. And they, they produce uh, a lot of very dangerous radioactive material. So the radioactive material is the result of the production of the nuclear power. But radioactive material is useless, it's of no use, it's just a waste. So what do they do with the radioactive waste? I oh, will put it in the bottom of the ocean and it will be okay there for at least 30 years. After 30 years, then we'll worry about it. In other words, they didn't know what to do with it. So they said, well, I'll just put it in the bottom of the sea and you know, we'll worry about it. Let other people worry about it in 30 years. So these are the kind of things which go on in the world today. And because we we behave like this in such a reckless manner. We create so many problems in the world. We get reactions. You cannot expect that you can do these things and not suffer. And certainly we suffer. Just like they do things like the different rivers which flow. If you go to the Ganga, you can see how they've done so many things to Mother Ganga and to the Yamuna also, how they broke the different, uh, the different roots of the Ganga, the, how they sp split into different branches, and they, they've done different things to irrigate different pa other parts of the land. And it creates more problems. Sometimes they cut down rainforests. In South America, in the Amazon, there are many rainforests, but they, try, they often like to cut them down and build factories or whatever there. And so it all, all upsets the balance of nature. All of these things have been arranged by nature. The rivers and the lakes and the mountains and so on, they're all gifts of nature, gifts of God whose nature gives of God, and they're there for a reason. But we take them, oh, something, oh we don't like this, we'll, we'll, do some, we'll knock down this mountain, or we'll change this river. We, do, we, we create so much damage to the planet. And because we try to utilize the planet for our own sense gratification, so we get reactions. Right? We get karma bandana. Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed. Otherwise that work binds one to this material world. Yagnata Kamanam Yatra Loka Yam Karma Bandana Tadatam Karma Kuntiya Mukta Sangha Samajana. Lord Krishna is describing, if you don't work for Vishnu, then your work is karma bandana, a bondage in the material world. And the bondage is the law of karma. The law of karma is very strict. Just like some countries are very strict. You know, some countries are very strict. Oh, you do anything, you get punished. You're very careful. You, know? you don't want to do anything wrong. So, just like Westerners, if they go to Singapore, they think, oh, Singapore, very strict. You have to be very careful here. If you, if you cross the road where there's no traffic, if you, you don't cross at the proper place, someone will come and find you and get a fine. Oh, Dubai is like that. If you cross the road at the wrong place, they'll, they'll give you a fine. And, and quite a bit, they'll take quite a bit of money from you. And they take your ID and so many things they'll do. 
So there's so many things. One lady was driving her car and somehow her bag fell down and she just, she, she had stopped at the red light and she was just looking to get her bag and the police immediately came to find her. 1,000 dirhams, like a 1,000 ring and fine. <laughs> you know, that, just for being, stopping too long at a red light. So, like that, pretty strict, you know, very strict. Some places, like, very strict. So, these kind of situations are there. Uh, that's material world. But there's also the law of karma, which is even more strict than the strictest countries in the world. Yeah. Because the material government, the, the law agents, the law enforcement people, they can't see everything. So sometimes you may get away with it. You may think nobody's watching. Just like at night, you can go driving, you can go on the highway, you can go really fast, and there's no, not too many policemen around, maybe you can really test out the power of your vehicle, you know, how, how fast it can go or not. But there's other agents watching, demigods, and they see everything, day or night. They know everything we're doing, and, they can watch, and, and they're keeping a record, and we get reactions for that. The law of karma is very strict. It grinds very fine. So we have to understand that there are laws in the material world. There are laws, and we cannot escape these laws. Just like the law of material world is, you take birth, you have to die. Because, you, because we took birth, because we accepted our material body, in course of time, one day we will die. It is inevitable. As sure as death. And death is sure. And you cannot deny that. That is, you could say, the law of karma. And we have to understand that these laws are there. You <coughs> cannot avoid them. We have to learn to live with the law. So, just like come to Malaysia, you drive on the left side. You go to America, drive on the right side. Different laws. You cannot say, oh, I didn't know. You have to, you have to know. So similarly, there are laws. People are doing things, killing animals, killing cows, eating cow meat. Oh, why do you know it was wrong? You have to know. You should know what we people should be. They should understand that there definitely there are things which we should do and which we shouldn't do. So we have to learn how to live properly in this world. How to live in a manner which will allow us to live in cooperation with the Lord according to His laws. He is the law maker, right? Laws mean there is a law maker. There's a passion behind this world who makes the laws. And we have to cooperate. We cannot say, oh, I, I don't like his laws, I think we should kick him out, put in a new lawmaker. <laughs> Sometimes people, of course, people do like that. You get atheistic people, oh, we should give up this God. His laws are too strict. Let's get rid of him, just promote atheism. <laughs> but then God is there for the atheist, God comes as and as death, he takes away everything. So in some other form, God is present. They, you, they may not see God as a person, but he comes in different ways to take away everything. So, Dhruva Maharaj is learning also from Swayambhu Bhamanu that he has to not be overwhelmed by anger. We can use anger in the service of Krishna, but it should be proper, it should be just, it should not be excessive. 
and you have to be in control of your anger. It cannot be uncontrolled. It can't just be our own frustrated lust which makes us angry. So we have to be very cautious about trying to use anger. So without being the master of the senses, we cannot use anger. All right, any questions? Maharaj, uh, would you please uh, explain the residence of the yakshas, their nature and their duty, Maharaj? The, the what? Would you please explain the 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 yakshas, their residence, their nature, and their duty? The nature and their duty. Well, the living entities. The duty of all living entities is there. The right? duty of all living entities is to develop our, our consciousness. So yakshas, they are. Uh, the ruler of the yakshas is Kuvera, and uh, we're called. That we were told here the yakshas live in a place called Alakapuri. Don't know where it is, <laughs> but probably that some people say that the yakshas are located in Tibet that they were from that region of Tibet. Now, Tibet, it approaches the, there's some certain regions which go into other parts of Bhu Mandala. You see, there's a region in the universe which is called Bhu Mandala, and Earth is just one part of this Bhu Mandala. And in, the, in Bhu Mandala, there is Jambudri. And in Jambudri, there's Mount Meru, Mount Meru. So, this is all described in the fifth canto Srimad Bhagavatam. So, the Yakshas, they have some position there in the, this Jambudri, where they reside. And there are different great celestial beings there also. And consider to be devas? No, not devas. Devas are more pious. The, the, the yakshas, they have mystic powers. They have some kind of magical powers. But they're not considered to be so much godly. But they do have some powers. In, and they're under the jurisdiction of Kuvera. And Kuvera, of course, is the treasurer of the demigods. So, that means the Yakshas also have some kind of wealth, some kind of power. So, arrogant. Mm. But Kuvera, of course, is a deva, but the Yakshas, they're ruled by Kuvera, and they're just jurisdiction. Yes, Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, thank you for your class. I have two questions, um, two comments, Maharaj, and one question. The comment is, India is exporting a lot of beef to Malaysia, despite all the temples and all the Vedic teachings going on in India. Maharaj, my next question, my next comment is, America had no choice but to bomb the two cities in the east because they refused to surrender. My question is, Maharaj, um, Krishna was driving the chariot of Arjuna and receiving a lot of arrows and bleeding. And I'm told that Krishna's blood is not like our blood. What's your opinion, Maharaj? <laughs> yes, Krishna's blood is not like our blood. Krishna's blood is spiritual. 
everything. Krishna's body is spiritual. So when he's bleeding, it is also spiritual blood. So the wounds are also spiritual blood? Yes. <laughs> Krishna is reciprocating. Demons would come, they would fight, try to fight Krishna, try to hurt him. Nobody could hurt Krishna. Their, their weapons would bounce off Krishna. But sometimes Krishna would allow their arrows, their arrows to push them, just like Bhishma, because Bhishma is a very special personality. So his firing arrows of Krishna are like offering of petals. So it's all rasa, so that is another rasa, shivori, the rasa of shivori, offering arrows to Krishna. Maharaj, one more question, sorry. Anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Maharaj? Dhruva Maharaj, he killed many of the yakshas. Is it because they didn't defend the, didn't Stop the one person who was killing uh, Uttama. Huh? I mean, do Maharaj, he had to kill all the Yakshas Maharaj. Is it because they didn't defend the person, defend, I mean, didn't lift the hand to stop the killing of the Uttama? The, the son of Well, we don't know all the circumstances behind the killing of Uttama, but we just simply know that Uttama had gone in the forest one time, and somehow he had an, an encounter with some yaksha, and that yaksha had killed him. That's all we're told. There are no details here about what happened. But one person had killed him. Or maybe there were a group of people, we don't know, but anyway, somehow he was killed and Dhruva Maharaj then took revenge on all the Yaksha people, the whole race of Yakshas. Just like when Maharaj Parikshit was bitten by Taksha, the snake bird, at the end of seven days, he, you know, he'd been cursed by Shringi to die from the bite of the snake bird. So Taksha came and bit Maharaj Parikshit. Maharaj Parikshit's body burst into flames. So Maharaj Parikshit's son, Janmanjaya, uh, he did a great yajna. He wanted to kill all the snakes. He wanted to kill all the snakes because one snake had bitten his father. So he was doing a yajna to kill all the snakes. But then, the Lord had to come to him and tell him that, you know, this is not right. You can't do that. That these snakes are part of the creation. And you have to follow it. Your father was bitten by one snake. But you can't kill all the snakes just because of that. understand that there are 400,000 species of uh, human beings mentioned in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, in the purport. So uh, I was thinking, I don't think there are that many ethnicities of human beings that we see in this world. Uh, so how do we account for that? Is it mining states or maybe others? Well, it's not only on this planet, but there are humans on other planets. There's other places where humans are also there. But like I was saying, Bumandala, there's the whole region of Bumandala, and there's many different regions there. And, and sometimes you can read in the Bhagavatam, it describes how like the Pandavas, like Arjuna went there into this region to collect gold. When he wanted gold for Maharaj, Yudhisthira's uh, great Rajasuya sacrifice. 
So he had to collect gold. He went into these regions and he brought a lot of gold back. Mm -hmm. So in these different regions there are humans there. Another question, Guru Maharaj. We hear, we understand that the three planetary systems, Bhu, Bhuvar and Swarga, um, but then we also see that uh, there are lower planetary systems such as La Patala Roka and all that. So where does this fall under? Is this under Bhu Mandal, the subterranean Bhu Mandal region, or is it another region entirely? Like, where is Bhu Mandal? No, where is like Patala Loka, or the Satsutala, Rasatala? No, they are below Bhu Mandala. They are all below Bhu Mandala. So are they categorized as Bhu Mandal as well? No. They're below Bhu Mandala. Mm -hmm. They're the, the heli, they're, you got a subterranean heli, subterranean heavenly planet, mm -hmm. and then you've got the hellish planet, mm -hmm. Yamaloka, mm -hmm. these places, they're all in the lower region of the universe. Mm -hmm. They're all below Bhu Mandala. Another thing also, when they mention Swarga Loka, yeah. do they only mean uh, Lord Indra's place or even higher planets like Mahatala? No, no, no. Swarga Loka is just Indra's place, just the planet of the demigod. Mm -hmm. Above Swarga Loka, then you've got the four planets Mahaloka, Janaloka, Dakaloka, Satya Loka. Yeah. So those four planets are different from Swarga. <coughs>